All right. Welcome to the uh, the 1015 session. Um, before we get started with Dr. Daya this morning, again, my name is Sean. I'll be uh, your secret behind the curtain, Wizard of Oz. Uh, so just a couple reminders. Uh, if you are in a group setting, I uh, recommend that your agency uh, get a training roster for those who are multi viewing multiple persons on one location. If you can't, send me an email if that's not a possibility for you because you're not part of an agency and we will get you a certificate of attendance. Uh, if you shared your registration link with somebody else, that person will not be registered and so we'll only see you multiple times. Uh, so if people want to have their own, they need to make, make sure they register themselves. Uh, all our presentations will be placed on our YouTube channel. Uh, all of yesterday's are already up and on there. Uh, if you watch them on YouTube, though, I cannot uh, provide you with your certificate of attendance. Um, that's up to you and your agency how they want to handle that if you watch them on YouTube. Um, uh, for your certificates of attendance, uh, if you're attempting to download, you cannot do that from your phone. You have to do that on a computer. Um, if you want to ask questions uh, during the presentation, what we've been doing is holding most all questions to the end. So just go ahead and put those in the question box. If it's something that has to be answered immediately, just let us know. Said, can we ask right now? And we'll ask that question for you. You can also reach out to us on Facebook Messenger at any time if you needed to ask any questions about the conference. Uh, the red arrow that's next to the comment, uh, the, the box up there, you can press that once it starts and that'll minimize it so you can, it won't show up and you'll see the full screen. Uh, make sure you register for the other sessions of today if you have not already. Um, we will always put the registration for the next session in the chat box at the end. Um, that being said, uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Daya. He did say, uh, and I'll let him speak to this, this is gonna go the full time, so there may not be a lot of time for questions on this one, or we can just run a little bit long, which is not a problem either. Um, so uh, Dr. Daya, uh, sir, it is all yours. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay, Sean? You sound great. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, thanks very much again for the association for the invite to do this talk today and the second one after this. So this first half is going to talk about the basic life support uh, update that came out from the HA in 2020. Um, let's make sure I can get my slides to work here. Um, as usual, I have some conflicts of interest which are listed on this side. I don't think they really have anything to do with this particular talk. Um, and if you're interested, you can go to circulation and download this. It's a pretty lengthy document and you can actually read through it, which is kind of what I did. And obviously you cannot discuss a 50 page document in an hour and go through everything. So we're gonna highlight, I think, what I think are important things for BLS providers to pay attention to. And I'll probably give a few twists of my own as we go along. And so hopefully there'll be some time for questions at the end. Um, so the first, uh, I think, really is the issue that uh, I think uh, is really highlighted in these guidelines update is the importance of dispatch CPR. And what they recommend is that dispatch centers, if you've not already done so, most have, but not everywhere, as we'll find, as we often find when you look deeply, implement a standardized algorithm and a standardized criteria to determine for patients in cardiac arrest at the time of emergency call. Um, Notice that this has a strong recommendation, but as often in many things we do in resuscitation science, the evidence is very low, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, they also recommend that dispatchers, uh, dispatch centers monitor and track their diagnostic capability of, uh, of, of, for, for making that diagnosis, and then uh, look at ways to actually uh, optimize what's called sensitivity, which is to minimize the times they miss recognizing a cardiac arrest and don't offer dispatch CPR. So this really all comes down to the slope of death. This is what happens when you have cardiac arrest. You, you know, if you get shocked, and luckily if you're in a uh, ICU setting or if you're in a uh, setting where people can watch your rhythm, you get almost 100% survival. But thereafter, the survival drops by about 10% uh, every minute. Uh, and in general, if you're arriving at, at, uh, at eight, 10 minutes out, your odds of survival have dropped dramatically. Uh, and this is for the most common, uh, you know, the most survivable type of cardiac arrest, which is an initial rhythm of ventricular fibrillation or pulses VTAC, what we call shockable uh, cardiac arrest. Um, the key here though, is that you can change the slope and you can change the slope dramatically uh, by basically starting CPR earlier. And this is essentially where dispatch comes in and the faster dispatch associate CPR can begin, 
um, instructions to get uh, uh, bystander CPR started, the better your odds are when you arrive on scene to, to, uh, to resuscitate this individual. Um, so basically, earlier CPR essentially means for us bystander CPR. Um, and, and this actually has a class one recommendation by the American Heart Association um, and, uh, and all resuscitation science bodies. Now, traditionally, the way things were rolled out is you basically had um, systems in which you had a 911 system uh, established with rapid EMS response. But you couple that with a lot of bystander training and CPR, and that was done in many systems uh, across the country uh, and continues to be taught. The challenge, unfortunately, is that having a trained bystander be happen to have to have a trained bystander be present at the time of an event is not always likely. And furthermore, if you have taken a CPR course, sometimes it's been some time, and your confidence in actually carrying out the interventions is sometimes limited. Um, so Dr. Eisenberg, uh, who's a world-renowned leader in this area, and probably the leader when it comes to uh, dispatch CPR or telecommunicator CPR, really has worked for probably 20, 25 years to sort of work on arrest recognition by, by uh, dispatch uh, uh, providers, um, increasing bystander confidence, and again, also continuing to work on building competent technical skills. And these things are all evolving as, uh, as we all evolve with technology. So you, as we'll talk about in, the, uh, in a few minutes, there's some things coming down the pike that'll make this even easier. So uh, what most of us have gone to is something called the all-caller interview for identification of cardiac arrest at dispatch centers. And that's basically asking two simple questions. Once you figure out who the caller is and, uh, and get some uh, basic information so, if they, uh, so you know where the location is and if they hang up, you can call them back. Uh, the first two questions you ask really are, uh, is the patient conscious? And the second question is, if, is the patient breathing normally? And we call this the no-no-go approach. And if you have a no-no-go approach, you basically uh, dispatch units rapidly. At the same time, you start giving dispatch uh, CPR instructions over the, over, over the phone. Um, um, one of the challenges when you're doing dispatch CPR is that uh, agonal respirations occur in about half of witness arrest. And it's actually a good sign because it means that the person's own physiological reflexes is trying to keep them alive. Because when you do agonal breathing, you're actually increasing intrathoracic pressure and trying to suck more, uh, actually interesting, uh, you're increasing what's called negative intrathoracic pressure and trying to suck more blood back and perfuse your body. But it's basically a very primitive reflex. Um, and un unfortunately, sometimes confuses people. But um, you know, uh, it's one thing that you have to uh, teach dispatchers when they're basically uh, uh, trying to implement uh, the no-no-go approach, because sometimes this confuses people when it comes to the breathing normally question. The key there is breathing normally. Snoring is not normal breathing. Um, noisy breathing is not normal breathing. It should be normal breathing. And if the answer is anything but a yes, uh, then you basically start down the no-no-go pathway. Um, so. These instructions are really important. And those of you who work in EMS, uh, you should work very closely to your dispatch um, centers to make sure that you, one, uh, work with them so they can identify um, the, the cardiac arrest, uh, make sure that they engage the bystanders, because often there is someone that's calling. Um, and reassuring things like medical hair, care is coming along is good. Uh, but at the same time, we need to help now is the next thing. And then basically, I'm going to tell you what to do. Now, what you've seen here is that it wasn't in the past where we asked people, would you like to do this bad CPR? We're actually telling them what to do uh, and because we found that that's the empowerment that they need from us on the phone. Typically, we have them go on the uh, back on the floor if possible. If not, uh, you can do it in whatever position they're found. You, you kneel by their side and you basically begin to uh, uh, coach them through CPR and you count with them. Uh, CPR is tiring, as we'll talk about in a few minutes. And so uh, it's important that you give them uh, confidence, you, you reassure them. Uh, and and this, is, uh, this is why you count with them, you stay on the phone with them. And one of the most incredible cases we had last year was a lady who, uh, whose husband uh, is young in his 30s, arrested at home. And the dispatcher stayed with her for 10 minutes counting until EMS could arrive. Uh, because of COVID, things have been a little bit more challenging when it comes to responding. Uh, to, uh, to calls, there's PPE, there's, uh, there was access issues in this case, but amazingly, this man is neurologically intact. He's actually a surgeon and back working and operating. So 
uh, amazing what this bad CPR can do. Um, in terms of what instructions uh, should dispatchers provide, the AHA and uh, the latest guidelines continue to recommend compression only CPR. Uh, it's the easiest one for people to learn on the other end and to, to follow. Uh, it's much harder for them to incorporate ventilation. And when you incorporate ventilation, you, you, you sacrifice compressions. So um, the issue of where you ventilate people with things like overdoses, hanging and drowning remain not very clear. But uh, most of us have just basically decided to go with the chest compression only CPR. Um, and unless you've got a trained bystander who knows and is comfortable doing ventilations, in general, that's not something the dispatchers uh, uh, typically follow. Um, it's really important that you look at these instructions and you're constantly evaluating this through any quality improvement effort. Um, the, the, as we've learned over time, our instructions have gotten shorter and shorter. We try to minimize the things that confuse people to get them to do basically compression only CPR as soon as possible. And again, don't ask, you basically direct them and you encourage them to do this. Um, so what's the evidence behind all of this? Does telephone CPR actually increase the proportion of patients receiving bystander CPR? There's lots of studies uh, and some of these are summarized on these slides here, but you can see that in King County, South Korea, Arizona, uh, Japan, uh, in both adults and, and children, you can see that in all of these cases, the amount of bystander CPR goes up dramatically after you start a program of telephone CPR. Well, you want to know if it, uh, you can increase CPR, but does it really do anything for survival? Well, the answer obviously is, again, yes. If you look at uh, all of these uh, communities, you can see that the odds ratio of survival goes up 1.5 roughly, depending on the population you're studying, uh, as well, and, and, and goes up as high as 1.81 in children. So clearly getting someone to compress the chest, changing that slope of death is hugely important. And if, you're, and if this is not happening in your community, you need to make sure that you're trying to get this going. Is it safe? Um, particularly, that's another question that's common to ask. Because sometimes you'll get unconscious, not breathing normally, and there may be a syncopal spell, maybe they had a seizure in their post dicto. Um, we have looked at this again in studies, and uh, this is one study here that's basically uh, published uh, in, uh, in circulation some time ago now. But basically, when you look at this data, um, if people who are in true arrest versus not in arrest, it's about 50-50. So when you, your dispatchers do aggressive CPR, um, they'll be doing CPR half the time when someone isn't uh, in cardiac arrest. That's okay. And remember that, that in general, if someone's not in cardiac arrest, they'll usually wake up, and just push your hands away. Um, and if you look at the side effects when people have studied this in great detail, it's actually very, very low. So the idea here is that yes, uh, you need to have, if you, if you have an aggressive dispatch CPR program, you're probably gonna have CPR being done at least two or three times more often than it's perhaps in the end turns out to be cardiac arrest, but that's completely acceptable. Uh, and so far as we know, the safety is pretty reasonable. Um, this is huge public health wise. Um, so basically uh, it again has a class one recommendation is actually a scientific statement. Whenever the AHA has something really big, it puts out a special scientific statement. We'll talk about some of these today. Um, and basically uh, they want uh, this concept of anybody unresponsive with not normal breathing um, is basically going to, should get telephone CPR. Um, and I think this is important because those of us who are 911 responders, we sometimes don't realize that they're actually the heroes on the other end that make the difference in that slope of death. They're probably the true first responders in the chain of survival, but often not, do not get enough uh, recognition or, uh, or, uh, or, and what we try to do uh, in, in, in whenever we have a survivor breakfast in our region is we bring together on a table everybody that was part of that chain of survival. So the dispatchers there, the person who did bystander CPR, the law enforcement is there, the fire department is there, or the first response service is there, the ambulance company is there, the physicians are there, the nurses are there, and that entire team comes to celebrate that person's life uh, when we have a successful save. So really important to engage them because they make the difference in making our jobs possible in terms of getting more survivors versus not. Um, I'll share with you one last uh, study that just came out uh, this year in resuscitation. Um, this is from Sweden, which has had a very aggressive dispatch CPR program um, for some time. And you can see that um, if you got 
if you got uh, uh, on the top slide here, if you've got no CPR, your, your uh, survival 30 days was 9%. If you got dispatch CPR, it went up to 13.6%. Um, and if you had uh, uh, a spontaneous bystander CPR by a trained provider, which is your luck if you have somebody like that, uh, it went up to 15.8%. So clearly we need to continue to train people in, in, in CPR. And this is where school programs come in and training people at a very young age. But notice the huge impact dispatch has. The other thing is that even if you've taken a CPR class a long time ago, by having a very aggressive uh, dispatch CPR program, uh, it gives people confidence to carry out uh, the interventions, which is basically chest compression only CPR. So um, that's uh, a bit on dispatch CPR, which is a big highlight of the uh, 2020 AHA uh, BLS guideline update. Okay, uh, finally, I'll tell you that if you're interested in this and if you're working with your dispatch center, it does cost a little bit of money, but um, the Resuscitation Academy is, uh, along with the American Heart, has started something called the Resuscitation Quality Improvement Program, the RQI initiative. Um, this is available through LARON and available um, um, for, for EMS agencies if, 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 if you want to work with them. And they can actually get your dispatch tapes, uh, listen to them, and provide feedback to your dispatchers to make this, this whole chain uh, related to dispatch CPR much better. Um, so look that up if you're interested in that. Okay. Finally, uh, here are the knowledge gaps that they identify. So whenever you read these guidelines, they usually have a set of knowledge gaps. Um, I've covered a few uh, in the dispatch area. Um, so the things that we don't know that's coming down the pike is will video linking, particularly now that everybody has a remote cell phone and can video call 911, uh, will, will, will that actually help uh, in terms of uh, the quality and the efficacy of dispatch CPR? Another thing we still continue to struggle with is how to recognize CPR. Sometimes there's language barriers, sometimes callers are really emotional, sometimes they insist it's breathing normally, sometimes it's a seizure type event. Um, more and more people are now looking at artificial intelligence and AI is basically going to be one of the things that you may see incorporated into dispatch CPR uh, or dispatch centers to basically help recognize uh, the presence of cardiac arrest uh, and then basically uh, in in encouraging the use of telephone CPR. Um, there's also things like operational costs that we have to look at and other things like what is the most accurate dispatch algorithm and instructions. Um, these are all, uh, you know, as I said, having been doing this for about 20 years, we've gone through several reiterations of our dispatch CPR cards and we're looking at them again this year. Um, and the constant, you know, the, the, the constant thing we're trying to do is make them better, more efficient, more effective so that they get the right thing done for the patient. Okay, let's switch on at this point to uh, uh, EMS CPR. So nothing really changed much in here when it comes to what they recommend for first responder EMS CPR. They recommend that EMS providers perform CPR with 30 compressions to two breaths, um, or you can use continuous compression, or if you're using minimally interrupted cardiac resuscitation, um, you can use that for shockable, uh, for, for a shockable uh, cardiac arrest. Um, and, uh, and and they recommend um, uh, this uh, 30 to 2 strategy until the tracheal tube is placed. Um, a lot of this really comes out of something called the Continuous Compression Trial or CCC trial that was published in 2015 by Dr. Nichol and colleagues and uh, our, uh, and, and these are part of the Rock Consortium, which is one of the sites that, uh, and, and Portland was one of the Rock Consortium sites. Um, and many of my slides today will be related to the Rock Consortium projects that we did. So in this group, they basically looked at two things. They looked at people who got a continuous compression strategy where basically you compressed and you gave the breath on top of each 10th uh, uh, each compression, or you actually stopped to give 30 to two. Um, so the first thing you do is whenever you do a study is you basically look to make sure that uh, it was a randomized controlled trial that basically the population was balanced. And in this study it was, they had actually, this is the largest cardiac arrest trial ever done uh, in, in the world. And it had actually over 23,000 patients in it. Um, you can see that in the primary outcome, the continuous compression had a survival of 9% and the control group had a survival of 9.7%. This is the group that got 30 to two. Um, and when you look at uh, uh, the outcomes in, in terms of neurological function going home or discharge, again, they were basically statistically not significant, but you can see the p-values here, which is 0 0.07, 0 0.09, are basically leading slightly towards uh, the 32 strategy. Um, 
when you look additionally, you can see that both groups got really good CPR in terms of CPR fraction, which is how much of the time you're on the chest compressing. Since if you're not compressing enough, uh, that could potentially decrease the amount of blood flow you're delivering to the brain and to the heart. Uh, but you can see that uh, this group usually gets more because you're on the chest more. This one gets slightly less, but still got pretty good amounts of CPR. Um, when you really look at the site level data, you can see that almost everything across the sites tends to favor uh, the intermittent uh, chest compression strategy of 30 to 2. So I think that uh, this is some of the reasons why the American heart uh, continues to favor um, the 30 to 2 strategy until you get an advanced airway in place. Now, given that that 30 to 2 is recommended, I think it's really important that you basically have to understand how you deliver the air, particularly if you're starting out with bag valve mass ventilation. Um, this is something that is very poorly uh, studied and unfortunately uh, often poorly taught as well. Uh, well. You may learn this first op in, in EMT school or um, uh, paramedic school, but then you quickly forget this. Um, it's really, really key that when you do a breath delivery, that the jaw be pulled into the mask, not the other way around where you push the mask onto the jaw. So this is basically trying to show the two thumbs down technique. This is really key. And you want to make sure that there's a complete seal. Uh, so you have to make sure that there's no air leak at all. This is really, really key when you're trying to do good CPR with bag valve mass ventilation, uh, especially in systems in which you have a limited number of paramedics uh, and advanced airways may not be instantly available. Although now with IGELs and other things, they are now available at the VLS level. The other thing is when you give the breath, you need to make sure you actually monitor does it go in easily? Does the chest rise with each ventilation? Does the chest fall with each ventilation? And do you get masking or tube fogging? And then most importantly is actually you need to look at waveform capnography. And I'll talk about this in a second. Uh, and then you basically make sure that each breath is delivered over one to two seconds to minimize interruptions. Um, so um, this is key because if you are not monitoring waveform uh, 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 capnography using waveform, you won't be able to tell if your breath is actually going in or not because watching the chest rise and fall is not a very accurate technique, at least in our experience. The best way is actually to see the breath create a classic capnogram. So what we actually teach um, at TVFNR and all the agencies I work with is this, um, you preload your mask and your, your BVM uh, with the internal CO2 capnogram uh, meter right there. Uh, so it's attached already. And this makes it very easy to monitor the quality of your breath as you go in. The other thing is that I, I can't play this video very well because of the fact that we're, we're using the Zoom channel, but uh, uh, I really recommend that you go to this dutchresuscitation.com site, which basically talks about a strategy of how you do this very effectively. To really do good CPR with bag valve mass ventilation, you need to have somebody basically uh, holding that seal. And the way they recommend is you do 30 compressions here, and then you stop and the person that's doing the compression actually squeezes the bag to deliver the two breaths while the second person uh, is actually holding the mask uh, as shown. So the focus here is on a good seal, a good mask seal, and then this person takes 30 compressions, stops, gives two squeezes, uh, and then basically goes back to compression. And this is how we are trying to teach it now so that the two, that when you have two person response initially, it can be well coordinated. Um, there are several things about EMA CPR that, that, that were commented on in the guidelines. Uh, other things they talk about are the fact that uh, a period of rest is important because you get tired, CPR is a tiring process. So they basically recommend that you rotate, continue at two minutes like we have for the last few years. Uh, they also recommend a firm surface when possible, uh, partly because if you're compressing on a mattress, you tend to basically dissipate the compression force and don't achieve as much compression depth as you'd like. Uh, and that can vary in studies from 12 to 57% of the compression is actually being dissipated by the mattress. So um, make sure you, you rotate every two minutes. Uh, I think the strategy here of uh, uh, doing 30 to two also allows this person to uh, recover a little bit of energy as they go to the next 30 cycle, uh, but they still have to move around uh, after two minutes uh, or five cycles roughly uh, with, with a fresh person if possible. The sequence didn't change much. Uh, they left it at CAB. You know, in the past we used to do ABCs, but this basically has stayed at CAB, although it remains controversial, particularly in children 
where we know most of the cardiac arrest are largely airway issues. So the question has always been, should we go to airway and have a different algorithm for children versus adults? It's ultimately felt that it's simply uh, to have, it, 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 it's key to have a simpler uh, approach and therefore we have the same approach for children and adults. Um, and that the slight delay in breaths in, in children is actually acceptable. And then in children, we use a 15 to two ratio um, is, is what you should be using. Um, so this is, continues to be recommended as a, uh, as a, as, as a as that our initial strategy should be compression uh, followed by airway and breathing. Um, again, uh, the duration cycle, as I mentioned, uh, two minutes is what continues to be recommended. Um, the next thing I want to switch to now is talk about quality of CPR. So this is by Dr. Deming, who's a very famous uh, um, uh, process person when it comes to industry. And as he says, it's not enough to know your uh, to do your best. You must know what to do and then do your best. So quality of CPR remains a high, high emphasis in the 2020 guidelines for BLS. Um, these are all unchanged. Uh, they recommend a manual chest compression rate of 100 to 120 a chest compression depth of five centimeters, which is approximately two inches and 51 centimeter, uh, 51 millimeters if you're counting exactly, but or 5.1. Um, and they also recommend not going more than 2.4 inches. Um, and then they all finally recommend to avoid leaning. Um, these are unchanged, but what I want you again to note is the very low certainty evidence which exists here because these have never actually been studied in randomized controlled trials. Um, what we have is largely observational data, which I'll share with you second in, in the next few slides. So if you're not measuring CPR quality, then you need to be doing this. You should be able to see every cardiac arrest that you do in your system and be able to pull this data out of your monitors. This is from Zoll, this is from the uh, Stryker Physio Control Monitor, this is from Philips. Each of these has technology built in today uh, with, with very rapid, um, uh, you know, with a very, it, it's very easy using their software uh, to basically be able to review your cases to see how well you did. Um, this is a quality statement that came out uh, from the Ameri of American Heart Association back in 2013, uh, emphasizing the importance of monitoring cardiac resuscitation quality. Uh, and it's really important that you have high quality CPR. And the only way you'll know you have high quality is to by measure it. And then if you find uh, deficiencies to work on improving it. So let's just remind ourselves what happens during CPR. So there's two phases in CPR. Uh, there's the compression phase where you actually compress uh, the, uh, the chest and, the, and uh, with your hand over the sternum, and then you relax to basically uh, um, to allow blood to come back. And these are important because this compression phase where you push down um, is actually the, the phase where you push blood forward and actually uh, uh, perfuse your organs. And then when you relax, um, that's when you actually, your heart gets perfusion. So basically we can think of this as Dr. Kudinchuk likes to talk about brain, heart, brain, heart. That's happening with each two compressions as you're giving it. Now, what I want you to do, pay attention to is what you're trying to accomplish. This is your aortic pressure and this is your right atrium pressure. And the difference between these two is called the coronary perfusion pressure. And the coronary perfusion pressure is key to successful resuscitation. Uh, this was shown many years ago, almost 30 years ago now, by Dr. Paradise from Detroit, who showed that essentially when you reach a critical threshold of your coronary perfusion pressure with good CPR, you actually get ROSC. So if you're trying to get ROSC, whether it's from a shockable or non-shockable rhythm, the point is you've got to achieve good CPR. And the way you do that is you've got to pay attention to both your compression and your decompression. Okay, This is really, really key. Now you've seen these slides before as well. They're basically released, I think, with the 25 and 2010 guidelines. But you can see that as you start compressing, it takes a while for the aortic pressure to go up. Um, and then um, uh, once you hit this threshold where your coronary perfusion pressure, the difference between these two uh, is, 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 is hits that threshold, you can basically, hopefully your shock will work or some of your drugs will begin to work and you'll be able to get them back. Um, but you can also see what happens here is how quickly the, uh, the coronary perfusion pressure drops when you stop compressing. And so this has been the constant key is that we need to keep our interruptions to CPR minimal, particularly when it comes to chest compression, because that's what's generating that coronary perfusion pressure. That's what's allowing that heart to be perfused with the hopes that we can get the heart resuscitated with our resuscitation measures, whether they be defibrillation, um, uh, the use of epinephrine or other drugs. So that's the key there. 
Uh, one more slide again, just to kind of emphasize is it takes a while for you to get up there. So when you pause, it drops rapidly and it doesn't take much. So, um, you know, three seconds here drops the coronary perfusion pressure dramatically. Uh, and then it takes again time for you to get back up there. So we need to continue to pay attention to uh, the coronary, to, to our, uh, to minimizing interruptions. So again, as I mentioned in the quality statement and then also in the guidelines, it's a high quality CPR, 100 to 120 um, rates of, uh, the depth should be uh, 2.2 uh, 2 to 2.4. Uh, recoil is completely important. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, you need to avoid hyperventilation and you wanna limit your pauses. And I put 10 seconds, but ideally the shorter you can make these, the better. But 10 seconds seems like a reasonable number. Uh, it's hard sometimes to do, uh, uh, to keep this shorter than that, but you can if you're really a high performing system. So important point, when compression stop, all blood flow ceases, both to the heart, to the brain, makes your job harder. So try not to stop compressions for long periods of time. And do you think this happens? Yes, it does. You can see this is a rhythm strip from a physio control device. You can see the compressions occurring here. Uh, they stop and you can see that there's a VF, VF, breaths are going in and they're just looking at it. They're probably trying to figure out should they shock or not shock, or this might be an AD where sometimes AD was taking a long time. AD algorithms of today advanced to the point where they actually try to get these shocks in within uh, within 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 three looks or 10 seconds or less. So that 10 second number is important to remember in the back of your mind. Try to keep interruptions less than 10 seconds. And again, if you're monitoring CPR quality, this is something you can look at. Um, what's the data? Uh, I think you've seen some of this before, but we'll share it very free with you again. So this is, uh, as I said, it's low quality evidence. So this is observational data. This is from the Rock Consortium looking at chest compression rates and outcomes. And you can see that basically the probability of survival to discharge is highest somewhere between 100 and, uh, and about uh, 120. I think it peaks about 115 in here. Um, now, um, I would love to tell you that, you know, um, you know I, I can tell you is 100 better than 110, 120. We tried to do that study, but it's exceptionally hard to do. And unfortunately, it wasn't funded. So uh, for now, we say between 100 to 120. But uh, there, this is the only human data we have, and uh, and uh, and basically, it's observational data. Um, similarly, with chest compression depth, this is also data from the Rock Consortium. You can see on the next slide here that um, survival. Uh, this is in green is survival to discharge. Uh, this is one day survival, and in in, uh, in black is ROSC rates. And you can see again that you tend to peak around um, 50 uh, uh, millimeters uh, or basically two inches. So you wanna hit that minimum depth of two inches. Really, really important because one of the things we'll often see is lack of adequate depth in CPR. So pay attention to CPR depth as well. The challenge with both rate and depth is they interact. So the faster you go, the less deeper you can get. And the deeper you go, the slower you have to go. So there's a relationship between the two, and that's something as well that people have to account for. So that's one of the challenges when you're trying to look at these students independently. They actually interact to a great extent. And so you need to pay attention to those two things. Uh, let's talk about hyperventilation. Uh, this is post-intubation, you can see a nice uh, capnographic signal here. You can see that people continue to hyperventilate. It's very easy when you intubate someone or put an advanced airway and you have a very excited EMT basic or EMT or EMR or paramedic for that matter, even a physician for that matter, who basically, um, you know, a cardiac arrest or high adrenaline events for the patient as well as for us. And so it's very easy to start squeezing that bag. You can see 15 ventilations going here over one minute. That's not what we want. Um, this is data basically from uh, Dr. Oftraidi way back when, again, uh, over 20 years ago, but shows essentially that if you uh, ventilate at very high rates, um, you essentially increase your mean thoracic pressure, which means that blood can't get back to the heart when you release the, uh, uh, the chest compression. And essentially, uh, that means the next forward flow will be less effective because you have an empty heart. Uh, and not surprisingly, survival drops. And 30 seems like a lot, but I will tell you, we routinely see 15, maybe as high as 25 sometimes. Um, so remind people to slow themselves down. You can use little tricks. You can use little timers on your bag valve mask, which is helpful in some cases, but keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, 
that you should not hyperventilate. You should try to uh, give a breath every six seconds um, and no more than six to 12 a minute is your ideal goal. Um, let's finish up with another piece on, on, on uh, quality of CPR, and that's related to something called pre and post uh, shock pauses. So um, you can see this is a rhythm of VF. You stop to take a look, confirm it, and you deliver your shock. So this is called the pre shock pause, this is called the post shock pause, and the combination is called the peri shock pause. Again, if you look at this data, which I think you may have seen before when I spoke with you a couple of years ago, uh, this was an animal study where they had unsupported VF for, for seven minutes, and then they basically took time off to deliver the shock. They stopped for three seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 20 seconds. And you can see that survival, just stopping for three seconds is 100%. But the longer you dropped in the animal model by 20 minutes, by, by if you stop for 20 seconds, you almost had no survival. And again, we have some human data, which comes from the Rock Consortium. You can see it uh, summarized on this uh, paper by Dr. Cheskas. But you can see that um, if your pre-shock is less than 10 seconds, your survival is 35%. If it's 10 to 20, it's 33. But once you get over 20 seconds, it drops dramatically. I mean, that's like a, a nearly half of the 35.2. Um, Post-shock pause is important too because we know that the heart after it gets shocked is stunned. There's no circulation going. Again, you want to continue circulating blood with CPR until your next two-minute cycle where you stop to take a, to, you know, take a look at the rhythm and potentially assess the pulse. Um, so again, you can see here that post-shock pauses of more than 20 seconds are bad. So our goal is to try to keep this as short as possible. Does this happen? This is a recent example of uh, cardiac arrest we had out uh, at one of the agencies I oversee. You can see that the time the, the machine is turned on, you can see the rhythm strip up here. The CPR is not showing because we're not using the CPR meter, um, but you can see that's VF. Uh, and you can see that the shock is delivered, but the pre and post shock pauses together were 14 plus 14 seconds. Um, they're still within that 20, less than 20 seconds, but they're not where our standards want to be. We want these to be under 10 seconds. Okay. Fortunately for this gentleman, he achieved a spontaneous perfusing rhythm after his shock um, and uh, ultimately uh, was taken to the hospital where he had an intervention on his artery that was clogged. So, um, you know, even though it was slightly delayed here, um, the outcome was good. Um, lastly, I'll talk about incomplete chest recoil. So remember, when you push down, that pushes blood forward. When you lift up, that basically allows blood to come back. That's that negative intrathoracic pressure you create. If, however, your hands don't completely come off, you essentially leave a positive pressure on the chest throughout your CPR cycle. And when you do that, you basically interfere with blood coming back. When that happens, you basically are not going to get enough blood back, and therefore you're going to end up getting uh, uh, ineffective CPR. So this is an example of uh, two types of patients. This is complete chest recall on the top. Um, showing breaths going in. And these are again, older, older times when we were doing different CPR to ventilation ratios. But you can see that um, when you have complete release, um, you actually can get this negative intrathoracic pressure developing that allows blood to come back to the heart with each release. But if you lean on the chest, this is what happens and you never get blood coming back. So you can imagine that with time, each of these subsequent compressions are gonna be less and less effective. So it's really important that you completely come off uh, the chest, and this is something to watch. When you're watching CPR, if you're the uh, PIC or if you're the uh, if you're one of the team members, and someone's not coming off the chest, you need to correct them so they're able to do this correctly. So again, five key aspects of CPR: limit interruptions, correct rate, correct depth, complete release, and avoid hyperventilation. And you have to monitor CPR quality. Um, in terms of feedback for CPR quality, uh, the newer machines uh, that are coming out will uh, have different variations of, of CPR in them. Um, some will give you a metronome, some give you uh, real-time feedback with uh, things like little uh, uh, triangles, that, or, sorry, uh, uh, little diamonds that you can try to uh, um, uh, fill uh, to enhance perfusion and, and, and uh, to, to the body and to the heart. Um, at the present time, the American Heart and uh, the, the Yale Core folks recommend that this be only used as part of a comprehensive quality improvement program uh, and, just not, and not used in isolation. Um, this is a program we use at one of my agencies, TBFNR. You can see that basically uh, we uh, use the software that comes with the Philips device, which is what we currently use. 
Um, and you can see it tells you when they're in, in target for both uh, overall, but also for rate and for depth. And then it shows you the entire code. And what you want to see is these gaps here should be minimal and less than 10 seconds. And then with the Philips devices, since they use an accelerometer, you can actually tell if someone's completely recoiling or not. Very, very important work that uh, that um, that that needs to be uh, uh, that we, we need to have more studies on this. But um, this is the kind of feedback we provide our our crews after each call. Um, another comment that uh, was that has been there for a long time is: Should I do CPR before defibrillation? This basically was unchanged from uh, 2015, although slightly modified. They say. They recommend a short period of CPR until the defibrillator is ready for analysis and defibrillation in unmonitored cardiac arrest. And again, they gave this a weak recommendation uh, with low certainty of evidence. So let me show you what happens to the heart so that you have a sense that this is basically five minutes in 10 seconds. So you can watch what's happening to the heart. I hope this plays. Oh. Cannot play mode. Um, it's unfortunate. All right, so basically, if you were to watch this, and I'll see if I can figure out how to make this play uh, at, in, uh, if we have a few minutes at the end. But basically, if you watch what happens to a heart that's fibrillating, the right atrium quickly dilates because blood's not moving forward. So this thing becomes really huge. And remember, coronary perfusion pressure is the difference between aortic pressure, which is what you get when you push down, minus the right atrial pressure, which is what's in the right atrium. So when you first arrive in someone who's unwitnessed, this right atrium is gonna be full of blood. Now it may not be as full if they've been getting bystander CPR, but the point is there's going to be quite a bit of blood still pooling in that right atrium because many bystanders don't do high quality CPR. If that's the case, what you're gonna to have to do is, um, is, um, is, is, is make sure that you try to empty that right heart so that you can get the best coronary perfusion pressure. And you do that by basically doing a little bit of CPR. The question has always been, how much CPR should I do? Should I do a little bit? Should I do a lot? So uh, Rock also did another study called the PRIME study in which they can, uh, actually measured something called the analyze early. And there were two arms, analyze early, analyze late. So they analyze early, they basically arrived, they started CPR and then they basically analyze the rhythm somewhere around 45 seconds. Um, where they analyze late, they basically analyze it at uh, about three minutes, okay? And these two, uh, amounts of CPR before defibrillation are both have been studied. One, this was the three minutes was used much more often in, in Europe, uh, whereas this analyze early option has been what we traditionally done in the United States uh, in North America. And when you look at the data in this particular study, uh, the outcomes are essentially equal. Uh, the numbers transported, admitted, survival of the discharge, and survival of the good neurological function defined as a uh, uh, MRS score or modified Rankin score less than three were essentially equivalent. So for the ROC uh, prime study, the conclusion was that uh, there was no evidence that a longer period of CPR was more beneficial than a sh uh, shorter period of CPR. This sometimes confuses people. And I think it's really important that you understand this. So if you are taking care of a patient with chest pain and they arrest in front of you, that person does not have a dilated right ventricle, right atrium. Shock that person immediately. You don't need to do CPR. I've seen people actually spend two minutes doing CPR when they should have shocked right off the bat with a witnessed uh, cardiac arrest. But if it's an unwitnessed cardiac arrest, it's reasonable to do a little bit of CPR. The question of how much is really, I'm not sure. Um, I think a minimum of probably a minute is reasonable. Um, some people still do three minutes, but I think that for us, um, we chose two minutes in our regional uh, EMS protocols locally, just because it kept at that two minute cycle. So for unwitnessed rest, we typically will do two minutes of CPR and then we'll take a look at the rhythm. But for the witness one, remember shock and don't confuse the two because I've seen that happen from time to time. Uh, actually, I've kept pretty good time. So amazing how fast 45 minutes goes. So the last thing I'll talk about is paddle size and placement for defibrillation. Uh, these are unchanged. Uh, they recommend that the pads be placed in an anterior lateral position or an anterior posterior position. The key here is that remember this, what you're trying to accomplish with your pads is to defibrillate the ventricle. So you want the position of the pads to be such that they're actually 
going primarily, the energy is going primarily through the ventricle. Um, so that's why uh, the anterior posterior position is still, uh, uh, sorry, anterior lateral position is still very acceptable, uh, or we can use this anterior posterior. But if you do the anterior posterior, make sure you put it um, across the ventricle where you think the ventricle sits, which is typically um, just to the right of your nipple line um, around the fourth intercostal space. Um, so remember when you do your 12 leads, you put you know leads uh, V2 to V6, mainly V3, 4, 5, 6 really show you the ventricle. And so that's where you should be thinking about putting your pad. Um, the uh, Again, they talk about uh, removal of hair, but make, make sure you don't delay uh, shock delivery. Um, and they don't recommend anything about specific electrical si electrode size, uh, but they do recommend that the pad be at least greater than eight centimeters. Now, this is something that we don't talk much about, but again, I think that in, in, in many things we do in resuscitation science, the, what we do matters in terms of what, how successful we are. So if your pads are not perfectly located over the ventricle, not surprising, your ability to defibrillate is going to be difficult, even if you have an AED because you put the pads not in the right spot. So pay attention to the pads. And this is actually kind of pointed out by a very nice study done again by the folks out of um, Stryker who actually looked at uh, three pad positions. And I, you know, this doesn't show super well here, but you can see there's a, um, a pad position which is slightly, uh, um, uh, slightly off to one side. Then there's a middle position and there's another position which is more on the inner. So it's an inner position, the middle position, which is the optimal position. Then you've got your outer position. Uh, and then they were looking at different defibrillators uh, to see how these different defibrillators worked in terms of uh, um, converting VF in these patients with first shocks. Uh, and these actually were, were not patients, it was actually a swine model. So, um, it, you know, again, it's, a, it, it's an animal model, but this is probably the only way you can study these sorts of things. And you can see the, the machines differed in terms of their total energy. Um, and what's surprising is that um, energy matters so that the 360 uh, uh, group did much better. But you can see slight changes in position in each of these being slightly to the left, slightly to the right, and not directly over the ventricle, decrease your chance of first shock success. So we don't talk a lot about this in, in, uh, in what we're doing, but everything you do has some precision to it. And if you wanna get the ultimate outcome, the best outcomes in cardiac arrest come from people who have witnessed collapse, get bystander CPR, um, who you arrive to find in VF and you can shock them and they respond to the shock. That's your ultimate cardiac save. And to get there, it's not always easy. And it's these little things that matter. It's the dispatch CPR, it's the quality of CPR, it's making sure you do a little bit of CPR defibrillation if it's unwitnessed. Um, and then basically making sure that all the things that you're using uh, in the next lecture, we'll talk more about the advanced life therapies, but at least when it comes to pad placement, pay attention to where you're putting your pads and make sure that they're located essentially uh, so that they're going through the, uh, uh, the ventricle. If you're using the anterior uh, lateral position, the, the pad ideally should be at the apex, the second pad. So it should be just under the armpit, just to the left of the um, of the nipple line, uh, so you can actually get the energy right through um, the, the heart. Uh, really small things like this can make a huge difference uh, in, in cardiac arrest outcomes. So um, in summary, um, I actually got through this pretty, pretty much on time, so we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, uh, dispatch CPR is emphasized in the new 2020 guidelines. Uh, 30 to two rec is continued to be recommended, although uh, depending on your agency, you can use continuous compressions or, or um, something called MICR, which is the Arizona protocol. Um, CPR for defibrillation continues to be recommended in non-EMS witness arrest. The amount of timing is sort of variable. Um, Pat positioning uh, makes it, can make a big difference. Um, so pay attention to that and uh, how you locate your pads. Um, high quality CPR remains a huge focus uh, of the uh, 2020 guidelines. So make sure you pay attention to rate, depth, complete recoil and interruption uh, minimization. And then lastly, I think that uh, one of the things that I've learned a lot is uh, the importance of mastering your bag valve uh, mask ventilation uh, skills, um, doing it correctly, making sure you give the breaths in uh, over a short period of time, and then monitor the fact that the breath goes in using real-time capnography. 
So I'll stop there for a second. Um, and uh, it's an old picture of me with um, with the uh, with, with when I first started working with TVFNR. But uh, I think um, I think I always remember this quote by Michelangelo that the greatest danger for us is not that we aim too high and we miss it, but we aim too low and we reach it. And that's a constant problem when you're trying to improve success uh, of outcomes from cardiac arrest. So let me stop at this point and let's see. Uh, I can turn my camera on and happy to take uh, happy to take questions. All right. Dr. Daya, here's a couple of questions we have. Um, I'm going to ask one first before the get in here. Um, going back to the dispatch assisted CPR, I believe it was mentioned a year ago when we were at the resuscitation conference up in Seattle. What country was it that was uh, is using? Uh, they're analyzing the phone calls as they come into dispatch to interpret quicker whether or not the patients in actually in cardiac arrest. Do you remember that program? I, I don't recall offhand, but I believe it's Sweden or, or one of the Scandinavian countries is using that. I know that uh, this is being, uh, the Seattle folks are very interested in. We have not started doing that yet uh, uh, locally, but this is something that I know that they're very interested in trying to refine the algorithms. Um, dispatch CPR is used um, a lot in Korea and Japan as well. Um, so those are the other two places, but I don't recall offhand which country is doing it, but I know that uh, the Seattle team is very interested in this. Yeah, I wanted to say it was Denmark or Sweden, and they could interpret cardiac arrest earlier. Um, so right. the other next question is, what is the difference between de novo and enhanced telephone CPR? Uh, so de novo CPR is just basically uh, talking about, I think, uh, trying to give CPR instructions over the phone. There's another program that the Norwegians have started where they actually can uh, use um, a cell phone and a video uh, streaming on the cell phone. So you can actually watch CPR quality. You can see the rate uh, that, the dis that the bystander is doing and actually watch that compression occurring. So I believe that's what they're probably commenting on when they see enhanced CPR. Okay, uh, this isn't so much a question. I'll get to some more questions. Can you either send me or we'll put in the, the chat the link to that video you couldn't play? Folks are wanting to see that. If yeah, sure. I, I, I'll have to see. I, I might have to just send it to you because for some reason okay. it didn't play. I, I've been unhappy. One of the reasons we talked about when we did our run through his videos don't always play as well as I'd like them to. Um, okay, so the next question is here is, wouldn't the drop in coronary perfusion pressures with pauses in CPR be an arg argument for doing continuous CPR instead of the 30 to 2? Yeah, so I think that um, that was the purpose of the trial that we did, the continuous compression trial. And when you look at the continuous compression trial, it's a really interesting study. Um, if you look at it overall, it's nine versus 9.7% in favor of 30 to two. So don't forget that, right? So that's an absolute difference of 1% roughly and the P is 0 0.07. So it means that, um, you know, you'd have to work, you'd have to do 30 to two and hundred patients to get one extra survival compared to continuous compression. The problem I think is that the, is that when you look really closely at 30 to two versus continuous compression has to do with the breath. So remember you want to circulate blood but you also want to circulate oxygenated blood, right? And so the problem that I'm having in my mind after looking at this data more clearly is that I think I think that we have gone too far to the right where we say it's all about compressions and just circulation. That makes sense for the bystanders. It's really hard for them to ventilate. But I think for um, individuals like us, uh, rescuers who respond to cardiac arrest calls in the community, I think ventilation matters because you, what you want to do is center on oxygenated blood. I hope that makes sense. It does. So I'm gonna, I'll put one out here for you, kind of a softball. So to that point, especially with our BLS providers, uh, where they have minimal resources, what do you think about the idea then of a nasal cannula at 10 for passive oxygenation when you have limited right. responders? Right. So now that's what they do in. That's what they do in Arizona. That's the middle, uh, that's the minimal interrupted chest compression. That works only for people with witness cardiac arrest who've got bystander CPR and your response time is short and have an initial shockable rhythm. The problem is that by the time you get to them, the heart's energy supplies are gone of ATP. And now you basically don't have circulating, you, you can't, if you're not circulating oxygenated blood, I think you have minimum amount going through. And the problem is that when you give nasal cannula passively, it's not really getting to your alveoli where exchange is occurring and where you're circulating the blood. So I think you really have to get down to the lung level. So, I mean, I'll tell you that, you know, I've sort of gone, 
um, a little 360 myself on this recently because we, for a long time, have been doing continuous compressions. Um, but uh, I, we reanalyzed some of this data and I was part of the reanalysis and it's a paper that just been submitted. And it shows you that it's harder to do 30 to two. Not surprisingly, it's hard because, you know, just like with bystanders have a harder time doing um, ventilations. But when you do 30 to two, um, the survival is better. Okay. And if, uh, you do 30, and if you do 30 to two properly, which means each breath going in, short amount of time, not a prolonged interruption in CPR, uh, and making sure you get a good signal that, that basically shows that you got a breath in. The next question here was there's a question about, I, I don't remember the physician, but there were, uh, he was doing some studies on continuing hands on CPR during defibrillation, not removing hands. Correct. Any yeah. So, so, yeah. So that's actually a great, uh, great question. In fact, there's another paper that we just uh, uh, reviewed on this. I think that um, the key there is you've got to use these gloves that allow you to be able to do CPR and shock while you're doing CPR. Uh, without interrupting. So basically you stop to see if there's a uh, VF. If there is, you go back on the chest, continue CPR, charge the machine up, and you basically do the rear shock. Um, that's uh, a strategy that's being used around the world by some people. The concern obviously is conduction to the individual, the rescuer. So this concept of hands-on defibrillation is getting popular. And I suspect that it most likely will become uh, a reality at some point. Uh, we need more human evidence. Um, I think that the safety evidence is showing that you can do it, but I think uh, there's always going to be some fear in top parts of people. So my understanding is you have to use special gloves that don't conduct. I'll, I'll ask a question then uh, along that line. Um, are you doing any research? I know you, you're collecting data still from your our local agencies on agencies that then use a Lucas device or the like that are continuing compressions through defibrillation and see if they're having any benefit or increased you know, survival. Yeah, so there, there's quite a bit of stuff that's come out recently on this idea of uh, essentially, um, can you, uh, and, and the American Heart currently does not take a stance on this because the data is not there to support C through CPR, or basically looking at rhythm analysis during CPR. The problem with compressions is they create artifact and you can filter out artifact and you can filter out noise, but if you're not careful, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble. And so essentially, um, many of us are not uh, using that technology today. Uh, Zoll does have that technology, but they don't, uh, I don't think they market it in a big way because I don't think it's precise enough. So the idea that you never have to stop, but I think the technology is getting better and better as we get better filtering algorithms and artifact filters in, into computers and other things that is essentially your defibrillator is a big computer, right? So if you can figure out how to take the signals, filter them and get looking at the right thing, I think you will begin to see more of that. What we currently recommend, at least what I do with my agency is that 15 seconds before that two minute pause that you're going to take a look, you pre-charge the machine. And you basically, when you take your look, if you stop briefly um, and you try to keep that under 10 seconds, if it's VF, you can basically at that point deliver your shock and go right back onto your chest. And that keeps your pre-shock pause very minimal. Again, is that supported by evidence? Uh, I'm not completely, I can't give you randomized control trial that that strategy works better than just basically uh, not doing that strategy. So uh, I, I can't prove it that way, but at least our experience has been, it keeps our pre-shock pauses uh, uh, shorter. Okay, any, any other questions for Dr. Daya before we take a break before the ALS side? Yeah, I need a break too. So thank you very much. Um, I, I'm glad that, uh, I, I hope this was helpful. It was great. All right, so there will be, uh, we'll take a break here. Um, there'll be, a, for those that are wanting to see the ALS, that's a different link. So make sure you registered for that. And then I will send to everybody the video link from Dr. Daya later. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.